So, let's open up in prayer. Thank you, Father, for coming here tonight. Thank you for this Shabbat, where we can discuss your word and your truth. Father, I ask that through your spirit you lead me, and through your spirit you prepare the hearts of the people, so they can understand your truth, and that you can speak what you want us to know. I just praise you for it, for this opportunity, in the mighty name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. Amen. All right, so tonight we are going to not take the video. So what you see here will be on the live stream. It's just a presentation with my lovely voice. <laughs> you don't need my lovely face on it as well. So, so what we're going to do tonight, I just want to clarify, but um, there's a few people who do not understand the concept of the Hebrew language. And as soon as you start to discuss those things, they think it's foreign, and then they label it. Now, the most popular term that people use to label anything that's connected to Hebrew is Kabbalah. Now, Kabbalah, just for those who are not informed, Kabbalah is based on the book called the Zohar. And the Zohar is basically written to uncover the mysteries of Yahweh's creation. So the way the Kabbalah or the Zohar was compiled was through the rabbis over thousands of years meditating on the Torah to find out what are the mechanisms behind the spiritual realm. And what the occultists now use is they use that wisdom and that knowledge to manipulate the physical by manipulating the spiritual. Now that is called occult and witchcraft. We're not supposed to do that. So if we meditate on the Torah, we study the Torah for the purpose of discovering who Yahweh is, who we are, what He wants us to do, what our future holds, it's nothing to do mani with manipulating the future or dabbling into spiritual things. We don't do seances, we don't sit here with Ouija boards and those kind of things. It's nothing to do with the occult. It is just Hebrew, it's foreign, so please don't label it as Kabbalah. We are using attributes of the Hebrew language. So Hebrew has got numbers connected to each one of the letters. And because of that, they add up to certain amount uh, 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 numbers or totals that link to other words now that is called gematria now gematria is also a technique the kabbalists use but it doesn't mean that gematria is evil if someone who's got an evil intent use it in the same way you can say that hebrew is evil because the kabbalists use hebrew to uncover whatever they want to uncover so you can use whatever means or medium for good or for bad. So Kabbalah is the negative entity connected to using the Hebrew and the Torah to get another uh, a meaning out of it or another uh, level of wisdom out of it in order to manipulate. So that's, I just want to put that clear because there's a lot of confusion out there and recently I've been labeled as a Kabbalist. So please, I'm not a Kabbalist. That's occultic and I will not dabble into those things. What I do do All right, so I'll continue a little bit with this before we start. Okay, so the Hebrew language has got different attributes. One is there's numbers connected to it. We connect numbers with numbers. It's called Hebrew poetry, or you connect thoughts. It's just the way the word works. It's the way our mind works. Our mind works with pictures. The word works with pictures. It's full of symbolism and little word pictures. Even the historical events are little stories with messages in them that can be depicted as a little picture. And the reason why Yahweh chose to work with pictures because we're like children and we love pictures. And now if we look at a picture, we understand what he was trying to say. 
And the other thing is, if you look at a picture, it tells a thousand words. So we don't have to explain things when you can see it in a form of illustration. That's why I use a lot of symbolism illustration, because that's what I translate from the symbolism of Scripture into that. So it's not evil. It's just the way Hebrew works. The other interesting thing about Hebrew is there's no vowels in the Torah scrolls. So if I change the vowel points within a word, it will change the meaning of that word. If I have two words next to, each, next to each other and I have different vowel points that I can play with, I can make about maybe five to ten sentences with two words. If I add another word, I can make even maybe up to twenty words or sentences with different meanings. And all those meanings support one another. It is as if you pick up a three-dimensional object and you now look at it at different point of views. And each one of us or each one of those uh, uh, inscriptions will describe a different aspect of that same thing. So that's the way you translate the scriptures. So the translator have to read the text and meditate upon it in order to get an interpretation. It's not like English or Greek where you just read it, it is what it is. You have to sit and think about it, think about it in its context and the words in the context with one another with the vowel points. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrew, you speak Hebrew, the process is easier for you to understand. But unfortunately, we come from a Western mindset, so there's a lot of misinterpretation for people who try to translate it. The other picture I would like to, to use is when you want to buy a new car, say you want to buy a red Mazda. Now, from that point onwards, you will see a lot of red Mazdas driving around for the next two or three weeks. Why? Because you are focused on what you want to achieve. In the same way, if I would have translated the scripture and I've got a need, a gap, or something I want to know, and I read the text and I meditate on it, something will stand out to me that will fill the void inside of me. In the same way, another translator will read the same text and get something different from the same text based on their needs. That's why the scripture is flexible enough to speak into personal people's lives based on their needs that they have, and that's the way Yahweh designed his scripture. And that is not evil, it's not Kabbalah, it's not occultic, it is a function of the Hebrew language. Now what I do, I look at the verse, I look at all the different words that it can mean, I look at the vowel point changes, I look at all the meanings, all from the Hebrew dictionary, not the Zohar, and then I explain the meanings of that, and we meditate on it and come to a conclusion which is a little word picture of something of essence that we can link to Yahweh's character or to our purpose or what he wants us to do or maybe prophetically what will happen to in the future. So that is the aim of these studies. It is not based on Kabbalah. Please do not confuse that. The fact that the Kabbalists use Hebrew, they use the Torah, and they use numbers doesn't mean that those things are evil. So people who don't understand it rather not say anything because you are exposing your ignorance through your empty statements that you make accusing people for who they are not. So please stop doing that. All right, so moving on to the next lesson. <laughs> so we are now on the third letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. It's the letter Gimel, and it looks like that. It's the middle thing. It's got three little crowns there. That's just... Uh, Torah Shofer font. Um, it's basically, um, if I can draw it simplistically, in Philip's Hebrew font, it looks like that. That's the letter Gimel in a freehand font. So it's the third letter of the Aleph Bet, and when you write it out, it's Gimel Mem Lamet. So it spells Gimel, and um, the Mem is blue, it's in the middle, and the Mem means water and also depicts the word lamet means shepherd staff it also means learning and these meanings actually come from the meanings of the letters if you look at the words how you write them out the meanings that are contained within that that's also not kabbalah that's found in the hebrew dictionary so that's the letter gimel now we're going to look at those three letters in relation to one another on a menorah pattern a bit later on we're also going to look at all the variations of writing the word gimel like Gimel, Gamal, and a few others, um, to see what that means. Um, so what you will see next is my notes. 
<laughs> it's the best I could do for the little time I had fair, so so Gimel Gimel Mem Lamet means camel. It comes from the word Gamal that means labor bearing a burden. And it's the third letter of the Aleph bit. Now we're going to look at the number three as well because Last time we looked at the bet and the number two and the concept of duality and choice and free will and love and all, and all those things. So there's something connected to the letter three as well. Um, and the letter three is actually the word shalosh, which is shin lamet shin. And shalosh comes from H7969, which is um, the word, shal uh, sorry, 7991, which is the word Shalish, where, is, where there's a, a Yod instead of a Vav. Shalosh is, uh, has got the meaning third, three, or three times. So that's connected to um, repetition. And in basic terms, the number three means covenant. Now we're going to look a bit more in the number three relating to Scripture to see if that is so. So there's some interesting things we're going to learn about the number three. So shalish, if you insert the letter yod, is a musical instrument like a triangle or a string three, uh, a three string lute. Um, it also means great measure, uh, a general of the third rank, and it also means prince. So now we see that the number three is connected to a authority. It's a general of a high rank, and it's also connected to a musical instrument. Like the person that's in authority is going to be worshipped or praised. So that's the connection we can make with that. Where the word shalush, uh, shalish is found is in First Chronicles 11, verse 11 to 12. And the context is of David's army where 300 men were slain by Joshbeam. Ah, oh, sorry, Dashubim. He was the chief. Well, let me just get the next one. Oh, sorry, I got my wrong. Um, So he is the chief of the generals. Oh, where's my notes now? Sorry. I'm missing something. Yeah. yeah, I'm missing a note. But anyway, so the chief is the word Rosh. Now Rosh is what we normally write like that. That's a Resh. And it means head. And in this case, it's called chief. So he was the chief of the generals. Now, general is the word uh, uh, shalish, uh, shalush, which is connected to the number three. So from that, we see um, the concept of the chief of the captains, of the chief of the generals, and also the concept of a king of kings or a lord of lords. So it's a concept of an authority figure that is higher than other authority figures. And that's a term that is used to describe the Messiah, Yeshua. He is the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. So when we look at the number three, now this is not in the notes, is the term Elohim. We know that Yeshua is God or he is Elohim. Now Elohim has three distinct meanings. The first meaning is servant and messenger. The second one is judge and the third one is king. So there we get the number three again connected to one entity that is known as a authority figure who is known as Elohim who is above other authority figures. So that's why Yeshua is the prince of peace, or the prince of the generals, or the uh, chief of the generals in this sense. And they slain 300 men. So that's the number three again. And it's connected to someone 
who is or an enemy that is defeated. So we see that the function of the authority figure is to destroy and defeat an enemy. So that's also what's connected to the number three. So what we learn now from the number three, not only is it connected to the gimel, it's connected to an authority figure that's higher than another authority figure who's got the purpose of destroying his enemies. So he's like a king who's got an army. So, where am I now? Oh, this is the next note. So Shalush, which means three, is first used in scripture in Genesis 5.22, where Methuselah was 300 when he begot sons and daughters. Now this is a very interesting concept. We get a person whose age is 300, also connected to this authority figure with this purpose, but he now has an offspring, and that's exactly what we saw with the meaning of gamal. Bearing a burden or to bear or to labor is also a term for a woman in labor and to bear children into the world. Now we see the camel is pregnant, bearing children into the world, or the gimel is connected to that. And the number three supports that by showing us that the number 300, where this three is found, is connected to a person that will bring forth sons and daughters, or that concept of an offspring. Now his name, um, Methuselah, is Memtet, uh, uh, sorry, Mem Memtav, which is the word math, that means adult man or mature man, and it also means to extend. So if there's an adult man, he normally contains seed, and that's why he can have an offspring bearing sons and daughters or bringing forth sons and daughters. So that's the, the, the math. Then there's a letter Vav in the middle, which is the connecting letter, connects the two words. And the Vav is also a term for man, or uh, uh, humanity. And then we get the word Shelach at the end, which is Shen Lamet Chet. Now Shelach means missile of attack. So now we see the king, whose purpose it is to destroy the enemy, has got missiles. <laughs> now the missile of attack is through shooting an arrow or throwing a spear, or in modern days actually shooting a missile. Um, and it also means a shoot of growth. So that means that there's new offspring coming and growing and coming out from the ground, and that links to begetting sons and daughters. And it also means branch. Now branch is a general term if you know prophecy, Yeshua or the Messiah is known as the branch. And a branch has offspring or little branches that grow from there. And the function of the branch is to bear fruit. So that's also a concept in the New Testament of the vine bearing fruit. And we are grafted into that vine. That's the branch. It also means sword. That's a weapon. So now we see what kind of weapon this king or authority is using to destroy his enemies, he uses a sword that he uses as a missile of attack to use it to stab and to destroy his enemy. And the sword is a concept that is known and connected to Yeshua with a double-edged sword coming from his mouth. Um, it's also the word. The word is the sword, the word of God that cut through bone and marrow. The sword is also um, a, a two-edged sword that cut towards the enemy, but also cuts inwards. So you dissect you and do some surgical operations to remove your little cancer cells which are connected to fleshiness and pagan traditions. So that is connected to Shalach, which is connected to the number three that is first found um, in scripture connected to a person who is bearing sons and daughters, uh, bringing sons and daughters into the world. Now, shelach comes from the word, uh, oh, sorry, shelach comes from the word shalach, H7971, that means to send away, to forsake, to give up, as in giving up your life, to depart down, as in depart down to the realms of death, to push away, as in the sense of being rejected. So, what, who does that sound like? That sounds like Yeshua's first coming, as the suffering servant and the messenger, 
all those meanings are connected to him. Shelach, all those meanings are connected to him in, as in the second coming, where he's the king on the white horse with a sword in his hand, or the sword coming from his mouth, ready to destroy his enemies. Who is he? He is the Rosh, or the head of the, 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 the uh, uh, generals, as we saw with the meaning of Shalish, which is the word uh, three, or the root word, uh, or the word that comes from the word three, which is Shalosh. So you see, everything is connected. So the number three is connected to the Messiah, and through the Messiah, we are in covenant with the Father or with Yahweh. So that's why number three is connected to the covenant, but through the one who establishes that covenant. And he is a king, an authority figure. But he also had the attributes or the pre-work that he came to do to come and suffer for us. To be rejected, to give up his life, to go down to the realms of death, and to be forsaken on the cross by his father. And then he rose again and he became this mighty king, the branch, who is ready to destroy his enemies. Now isn't that a beautiful picture connected to number three and the Messiah. So if you want to study the Zohar, you will not find that in the Zohar. Just a bit of a sarcastic comment there for my uh, skeptic viewers. All right, so where is this now? Ah, this is the missing one. <laughs> this was the second slide. Chief of the captains, there's the word Rosh. Um, Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to skip that one. Okay, now we're going to look at, we just looked at the number three. This whole thing is mixed up. I think my slides broke. Let me rather follow my notes and I'll just skip to the right page. Otherwise, I'm going to just miss the point here. Okay, so we just finished the number three. Yeah, we're actually on this page now which is the bottom part of Shelach and Methuselah. So Methuselah is a picture of the Messiah called the branch and he has a sword coming proceeding from his mouth that he didn't mean a second coming and as I said the second uh, first coming he was rejected um, and was uh, he gave up his life and he entered into the grave. Number three associated with the Messiah Yeshua, who is the head of his body, and his body is are the sons and daughters that were brought forth. That's connected to the number three that we saw with Methuselah. Um, yeah, so that is basically concluding all the meanings of number three. Okay, the next one is Gamal. H1581. Um, now the technique I use is whenever you, f you want to find the true meaning of a word, you either go to its root word or you f find where it's first used in scripture, or you can use both. You find the word where it's first used in scripture and its root word and where the root word is first found in scripture. And then you have two passages connected to that one word, and then you start to translate or meditate on those ideas in relation to one another and because you are a, s a scholar of the scripture there's verses that will pop up in your mind that will support what you see before you but the, the Hebrew will give you some added content that will color, color it in a bit more so that's what we would try to achieve so it's first found in scripture the word Gamal um, in Genesis 12 verse 16 the context is Sarah was taken into Pharaoh's house and then he said, and he treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, men servants, maid servants, she donkeys, and camels. So there are seven gifts that Abram received from Pharaoh because of Sarah. Or you can say that Sarah is a picture of the bride having these seven gifts or attributes linked to her. So we're going to look at these seven things associated with Sarah who's a picture of the bride of Messiah 
So the first one is maid servant. Now maid servant is the word Shipcha Shin Pai Chet Hey. And it means to spread out and also bond women. And this is to do with spreading out as a family. Now we saw that same uh, uh, meaning basically linked to Methuselah um, from the first part of his word math, which is metaf, that means to extend. So we see the same concept, but this is the female uh, connection to that same concept. Now, Shibcha is from the word H4940, which is Mishpacha. Uh, uh, and that means family and tribe. And the, and the word family is also connected to the word Bana that we looked at when we discussed the letter Bet. Can you remember the word Bana? I will draw you the picture. So sorry for those who are online you won't see my little picture we're at the bed a little man there that was divided into two and we had the letter nun in the middle and we let the head hey there this is male and that's female so bet is female that is the concept of the one who creates the household. That's female. The nun is what is binding those two concepts together, the male and the female part. And the nun is basically the covenant relationship or marriage. And nun also means fruitfulness or the fruit that will come from that relationship. And on the left, you get the letter hey, that means truth and light. So the male's function is to bring truth and light so he needs to teach his wife and children in the ways of Yahweh the woman the female she is the one who look after the household or the children and together they have offspring which is the nun and the nun is also what's connecting them and if you put that on a menorah pattern the letter nun is the most important part so the covenant between male and female is the most important part and your offspring as a married couple is your most important function as being married in order to bring forth um, children in the ways of Yahweh and that's to do with the concept of the birthright throughout history through Abraham Isaac and Jacob carrying the birthright is carrying the idea of the message of Yahweh that you want to fulfill throughout the generations until the Messiah come so that birthright is associated with that. And we carry that same message today in our teachings that we need to teach our children. Also the message of the coming of Messiah. But this time the second coming, not the first one. So that is the house. The concept of the house which is associated with the maid servant. Now the main servant is the word ebed. Ayan bed dalet. It comes from the word Abat, not Shabbat, but Abat. <laughs> and Abat means work and worship. So this is an interesting concept if you connect the two. The previous one has the idea of a family and a household or a tribe. So, or a house. So now we have a house of worship, which is the male part. So it's the role of the male to instill within his family to worship Yahweh and it's the female who have to create that safe area to do that. Now if you look at Letty and myself, we are basically fulfilling that role here tonight. She is the one who set everything up for the family to have the facilities ready. That's the house part. And I'm doing the hay part. I'm shining through whatever I'm teaching <laughs> through the words that I speak, which is the hay the light and the truth associated with Yahweh's word. So we see the same two concepts, um, uh, maid servant, male servant, and the combination of that is a house of worship. And that's what the first two concepts give us. And where, where did we start? We start with the word Kamal, that means camel. It also means to labor, 
carry a burden and to bear a yoke or to bear a cross. So what does that, does, uh, that tell us? It tells us that the health of worship is not an, uh, an easy job to maintain. The house of worship take hard work and effort to set up, to, to uh, 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 create uh, 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 the outreach to other people, to, do, uh, 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 to go out and reach people outside of the house, bring them in, and if there's any issues, to resolve those. If there's any confusion, to clarify that. So it's, a, it, it's, it's from that point of view, uh, facilitating the house as a body an effort. So that's a burden you carry, but that's what Yeshua wants us to carry. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He didn't say there is no yoke and there's nothing to carry. All you have to do is sit back, sing me a few songs, and I will come and rapture you. That's not what he said. He said we need to carry his yoke, but it's light. We need to carry his burden, but it's easy because we don't do it in our own strength. So that's the next thing we're going to look at is the strength part and the meaning of Gimel. But before we do that, I just want to finish the attributes or the gifts. So the first gift, the first gift that we got is a house of worship that is given to the bride, Sarah, by the king. The next thing that was given is a he donkey and a she donkey. So there's also a combination there. We had the male female servants. Now we get the male and female donkeys. So the he donkey is the word chamor. It comes from the word chamar, that is chet mem resh. Now that's actually how you write the mem. Just for those who can't see that far. Now a mem looks like that. <laughs> so I'm trying to clean up my fonts. <laughs> I usually did that or whatever. That's also a beautiful mem. That's my own. <laughs> um, so that's chamor. The chamor means trouble to boil, to seal up, to cover and be red. So if you sit in a boil, pot that's boiling, you will turn red. That's the idea. And that means it's not an easy place to be. It's a place of trouble. So what is this trouble all about? Where this word is first found in Scripture is in Exodus 2 verse 3 where he said, where the scriptures say, she made an ark of bulrushes and daubed, uh, daubed it, which is the word chamor, oh sorry, chamar, with slime and pitch. And that was made for Moses. So Moses' mother made him a little ark. Just like Noah built a little ark or big ark. Um, and the context is salvation in the time of trouble. Because the king was out there to kill Moses. His mother made him an ark with a covering to protect him during the time of trouble. And the time of trouble is the time of judgment or, or persecution. Now in the time of Mo, uh, Noah, Noah built an ark. He covered it with pitch. Because that's a symbol of salvation in a time of trouble or a time of judgment. So what is the pitch to do with anything? Now pitch has got another meaning. I'm going to give you another word for pitch. I'm going to see if you can read this. I'm going to write it in Hebrew. You can read that. What, what's that first letter? Or the chet, yep. Yeah? Yeah, nun so fit. So what does it spell? Which is? Which is grace. Now, let's look at gen for a moment. From a break perspective. Now, I need to, I'm in the physical. I need to approach and reach out towards what is spiritual. So in the physical... I face the noon first. And I have to go through the noon to access the chet. Because the chet is on the right hand side 
I'm on the left hand side, I'm in the physical. So how do I access get? And what does get mean? In this case, it's life. So I can access life, now it's life on the right hand side, so it's eternal life, I have to access life, but through the nun. What does nun mean? Two things. It means fruitfulness, or to bear fruit, but it also means I am the fruit of someone. I am the offspring of someone. I am born from a family. That's the other aspect. So there's two aspects. The one is to belong to the family of which I'm an offspring. So that gives you access to the chet. And the other one has to do with bearing fruit. And if you can remember in the New Testament, it says, uh, it's got the parable of the talents. Now the one with the one talent to uh, bury it in the ground, it didn't even water it. What happened to him? Good on you, wonderful servant. You've kept my little talent in the ground. Come into my glory. Now he said, go away from me. So he did not multiply that was given to him. The one with the two talents, the one with the five, multiplied or they had an increase with what was given to them. So what is given to us is truth or in this case, gifts that we need to use to multiply and bring people in, and also to multiply and grow spiritually, bearing fruit in our lives. So if... Yeah, it's, it's what you do with the truth. How do you multiply the truth into others? So it's, it's, it's like, it, it, one, one example is to teach. I receive truth, I teach others, now I've duplicated this truth in two people. So that's also a form of multiplication. Or I can study more and learn more about Yahweh's things. Now I've gained some fruit or multiplied in the knowledge of Yahweh. That's also bearing fruit. And increasing in your character, becoming more like Him, is bearing more of His fruit, which is the fruit of His Spirit. That's multiplying again. So what does the, um, the gardener do? With the grapes, with the little things that don't bear fruit, the little branches. What does he do with them? No, he paint them gold and he use them as decoration in his throne room because of grace. No, he cuts them off and he casts them away. <laughs> they are absolutely useless without fruit. So that's why I wanted to say this and I'm now I'm going to get in trouble. Eternal life as a prerequisite of you must bear fruit in your life that is associated with Yahweh's word, Yahweh's truth. And if you do not bear fruit, you will be cut off. And there's scripture for that. It's not me saying that. And we see the same here. But look at what word we are actually looking at. We're looking at grace. Now grace has got a prerequisite to access what grace is all about, which is eternal life. Grace is not free. Grace is not cheap. And that's what we saw with this. It's, it's troublesome. There's persecution. There's things coming. And with the previous word, we also saw it's a burden. It's a yoke. It's something you carry. It sometimes is difficult. It's sometimes difficult to walk in this life trying to walk in Yahweh's ways. People will always find fault with you. Why? Because there are faults in them they want to hide by pointing the finger at you. So if someone accuses you, you know, and they accuse you a lot of, of, of a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with that poor person accusing you. If they find one thing wrong in me, I know there's one thing wrong in that other person. Because, now that's my own little analogy. Just in the scale of, of balance. So, where was I? Moses had the little ark. <laughs> and... It was for his salvation in a time of trouble. And that covering, now I'm going to use the same analogy of grace. Now if you can look at the ark of Noah, which part of the ark can you say is connected to grace? Now we've got the wooden construction. That house, 
it's probably have a roof that's got protection. What will keep this boat afloat? The pitch. So the pitch is the most important thing of the boat. But do you need only pitch? I can give you a drum of pitch, but you will sink if you hold on to that. You will definitely drown because it's heavy. You need to apply to something else in order to give it its essence. So if I can explain grace as the pitch, because we are saved by grace, we're actually saved by the covering, which is the word uh, keeper, where Yom Kippur comes from, day of atonement or day of covering. And the covering was by the blood, and the blood is something you apply just like pitch. So grace is something you apply just like the pitch is applied to the boat. But pitch in itself doesn't mean anything unless you apply it. And the boat is the mechanism of salvation. So I can have the mechanism of salvation. What's that? It's the word. All the things Yahweh will teach me about his character, what he wants me to do, the gifts, how to work in the, in the kingdom, within the body. That's the boat. That's a vehicle for carrying something from one place to another. So the body of Messiah is carrying from one place to another. And the word of Yahweh gives us the instruction on how to do that effectively and in love and not to kill one another. But we still need to apply the covering. So without the covering, doing all the works inside the body means nothing. It's only the covering that's safe, but it's a collective thing. You need both. So you need to have the fruit that's associated with the body and all the things that happen within the body to access life. And also the covering, which is the blood of Messiah. So that's just a little derail onto that. Now, she donkey is the word aton, which is aleph, taf, vav, nun. Aton um, is she donkey. It comes from the word etan, or some people can uh, uh, pronounce it Ethan. That's also her name. Etan. So if you've got a, a boy that's name is Ethan, it means she don't care. <laughs> you girly, girly name. Anyway. <laughs> so Ethan, just have a, a vav, a chayot, instead of the vav, uh, between the, the aleph and the taf. Now, etan means ever-flowing stream. And it also means strength, mighty, and strong. So this is the other concept that I want to underline here. Is that we have salvation in a time of trouble. But you need strength. And an ever-flowing stream in order to survive the time of trouble. Remember the donkey is connected to the donkey and the maid servant is connected to the male servant so these two can't stand by themselves so we do have salvation we have covering and we have um, a time of trouble but within that we need the ever flowing stream and we need strength and be mighty and strong courageous and strong so what is the ever flowing stream what does that represent and where is living waters found in scripture? So I'm going to draw a little picture. That's on the next slide at the bottom. So there we have a stream will flow from a hill or a high place downwards. And at the bottom of the stream there will be a tree and this tree will bear fruit little noons and if this tree is seen from a distance it will look like the tree shining yeah, that, I think that's what the tree of life is that's the letter hay the the stream is the is the letter oh no now I can't even make my own mem. <laughs> That's my old mem. 
and on top of the stream we get the symbol of strength which is the Aleph that means ox it also means yod hey vav so the Aleph is a symbol of strength so we get the strength and the ever-flowing stream and putting it all together we get the word Aleph then we got a Mem then we got a Nun and then we get a Hey and that makes the word Amuna that means faith and truth so now we see from the he donkey the he donkey we get the concept of what is described in Psalm 1 his word is like a stream of living water flowing directly from Yahweh and the tree feeds from that stream and bear fruit and that is what faith is about so now we see that in order to survive the time of trouble you have to have faith now faith now has two components the one is strength the one is the stream or the one is the ox which is the Aleph that's Yahweh's strength the other one is Yahweh's word which is the Mem so I need his hand in my life and that's what I saw when you look at Ethan where we had a little yod in there which is a symbol of the hand of Yah Yahweh that's now been inserted into this word so it's his hand that will give you that strength and his word so we survive this time of trouble through his spirit and his word not only the spirit not only the word but both and that's a problem that I see with the two extremes and I'm talking now about my Jewish brothers on the one hand they only go towards the word and then my Christian brothers who are to the extreme they only want the spirit they don't want word because they say um, nobody has to teach me anything because the spirit will reveal everything to me but what they do not understand is the pattern that's been given as the spirit reveals is the tabernacle pattern and the holy place where the menorah shine upon the showbread so the menorah doesn't reveal anything itself except that it's light so if I stare into the light I won't see a movie on Netflix there's no information there except it's light it's a source of power it's a source of light and it gives me the ability actually to see stuff but and then I need to look on the other side of this oh there's a book now I can read the book but I can't read it without the light and that's where the spirit will reveal things to me comes in it's not the spirit where you go up the mountain you sit there and meditate and then you download all these supernatural revelations which is totally contrary to scripture it is revealing what the scripture says that's what it means so people who have an idea uh, an idea in their head that the spirit reveal new things there's no such thing if you build a house you can't say okay let's build a foundation now it's time to build the walls okay let's get rid of the foundation oh what the hell get rid of the walls let's just put the roof on I don't need the others no you build systematically now the, the Torah is the foundation the prophets are the walls the New Testament is the little roof you need all of that to actually have an house you can't throw away anything otherwise you don't have a house that stands if you have no foundation New Testament says that your house will not stand it is built in sand so don't take away your foundation your house will fall so people with Hebraic mindset living 2,000 years ago knew exactly what Yeshua was talking about we living in a modern society we think it's nice ah if I build a, a house on the beach surely it can stand if it comes from Stratco because it's strengthened in itself it can stand on sand mate I don't need a foundation and that's why they abolish the foundation and just cling on to the roof um, so it's a bit silly isn't it all right so what we see from the he donkey and the she donkey is time of trouble salvation and we got the strength of the spirit and the word of God that's a continual ever flowing stream it never stops so that means that you will never ever 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 stop learning you will never stop growing if you stop growing you're like a tree then you're busy dying so you should always grow how do I grow I ask Yahweh show me what is wrong with me help me to understand I'm confused with this 
reveal this to me, always asking questions. Not be satisfied sitting on the bench, I'm right, everybody else is wrong, and then you take time out of your day to go and si dissect someone else's life to point to them how wrong they are, but we're not supposed to look at other people and show them that, that they are wrong. That's the Holy Spirit's work. You need to look into yourself. You are the, the project that you need to work on. Leave other people alone. Yahweh will deal with them, and it's those people's responsibility to have a relationship with Yahweh to sort them out. If they're off the rails, pray for them. Don't sit there and dissect and publish. All right. So I'm saying this specifically for people who are very outspoken. All right. Next one, oxen. So we got oxen, camels. So the oxen and the camels are also a link. Oxen is the word bakar, bet kof resh. Now this is an interesting thing that I saw um, on the bus today when I drove, traveled back on the bus home. The word bakar is actually a process as well. I've got a few pages, sorry. So we have Resh on the one end. I'm going to write here. And then we have a Kuf, which is the letter Q. And then I have the letter Bet. On the right hand side. Bet. Kuf. Gee, that was nearly a good catch. And Resh. So when we look at these words, the letter Kuf means the back of the head. It also means to repent. That's right in the middle. If I put that on the menorah pattern, it's the most important thing. It's to repent. The house of Yahweh can also be seen as a kingdom. And the kingdom has a city and a temple, which is a house with people and a king. And it's all about the household of the king. And that's what we saw, I think, with a little bed. Where they traveled over the Jordan. And it, the, house, uh, the household of the king traveled across to the other side. So that was the Abar, Hebrew, that study. Um, so the letter bed is the goal. Because it's on the right, it's spiritual. I'm on my way there. That's where I want to go. The kuf is the means. And that is repentance. Or to turn the head. And then the last one is the resh, which is the head or the shepherd. So, and this, basically, all of this, is the gospel message. What is the gospel message? Repent, for the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. Repent for the household of the king, or the house is at hand for entering into the house. And who is preaching that? The shepherd. He was the one preaching that message of repentance. And that is what we see with the word for oxen or bakar. So oxen represent the gospel message. Now if you look at the primitive root of bakar, which is also pronounced bakar, probably bakar, <laughs> and bakar, um, means to inquire, to seek, and to search. 
So they who seek the kingdom will find it. Because that is the goal. They who seek to enter into the house of Yahweh will enter eventually. Because the shepherd, the rest, will make sure that they will enter. But there's a prerequisite or a process that needs to happen before you can enter. So it's not a free ride. Oh, I know the, I know the guy at the gate. He will let me in. It's like uh, going to a, a disco or a, I don't know what place to go. There's a, little, there's a big bouncer at the, at the gate. But you have to pay. But if you know him, you can go in. It's not like that. <laughs> Even if you know the Messiah and you refuse to repent, you can't enter the house. Where's the scripture in the New Testament that tells us that? Lord, Lord, we've done great things in your name. We've cast out demons. We've done this, that, and the other. And he said, go away from me. I do not know you, which is a term for intimacy. I've got no relationship with you. You workers of lawlessness. You've got no structure in you. How do I get structure? Or why do I need it? I need to stand it. To be measured against to say, listen boy, you can't carry on do this. Why not? It is written. You shall not commit adultery. Oh, I won't do that again. Now I repent. Without the knowledge of the standard, repentance will be futile because people would not know what to turn from and what to turn towards. That's why the commandments still stand because it's just the standard. It doesn't mean that the standard will get you in. You need the shepherd as well. So only through repentance, having the word won't get you into the house. You need to know the, the guy at the gate, which is Yeshua. But only knowing Yeshua without knowing the standard and repenting won't get you in. You need both. That's why the word and Yeshua will allow you into the household. Same picture, same principle. And that concept I would like to call balanced truth. Truth doesn't stand on one leg. You can't say, ah, oh, because of his blood I'm saved. No, that's standing on one leg making a statement. You have to have the full gospel message. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. Who is saying that? The Messiah. Ah, oh, I'm going to follow the Messiah. I'm going to accept his sacrifice. Now I've got the full picture. Now I've got the, the balanced truth regarding what is required for salvation. It's not only one, it's not only the other, it's both. Interesting, the word search is also found in scripture, is the word derosh. And there are, that word is found twice in Leviticus 10 verse 16. And those two words, if you count the first five books of the Bible, you count all the letters, you divide, all the words, you divide it into two, you'll end up right in the middle of those two words, which is derosh, derosh. There's an equal number of words from there to the end of the Torah, and there's an equal number of words, uh, or, or the same amount of uh, number of words from there to the beginning of Genesis. So it's the center of the Torah, or the heart of the Torah, what it is all about. And the Rosh Darash is translated as certainly search. Keep on searching. What did the Bereans do? They searched the scripture daily to see if what Uncle Paul said is the truth. Can we just take Uncle Paul's writings blindly without balancing it out, trying to interpret it the way he intended it? Now we need to search the scripture to interpret Paul's writings. They tested Paul back in the day. Yes, Paul was talking the truth now. Now we need to test Paul's uh, translation to see if it is still Paul's words. And how do we know that? Paul was teaching from the Tanakh. Everything in the Old Testament was his foundation. He stood upon when he preached, revealing the Messiah, revealing the covering, revealing grace on the basis of the foundation he stood on. So if we don't have the foundation, you will interpret Paul's writings the way you want it to sound, and you will have not have a balanced truth. So people need to have a full understanding of the whole of Scripture in order to accurately interpret Paul's writings. Because that's where Paul was coming from. All right, so what is in Leviticus 10, 16? It says, Moses searched 
No, this is nonsense. I think that's Genesis. Moses didn't search to go. Does, does someone have a s scripture there? I think I've got the the wrong reference. No, no, this is Leviticus. I think this is the one. No, it is this one. Just check Leviticus 10, 16 quickly. 10, 16, yeah. Okay, that is the correct scripture. So, no, Leviticus. Yeah, that's where you find the Rosh Tarash. is searching a goat. So what is a goat a symbol of? Let me go back. Oh, it's a symbol of that word. To cover. Kippur. Kippur had two goats. Yom Kippur had two goats. So why, how can a goat be a sin offering? I thought it's a lamb. The Passover is a lamb, isn't it? Yeah, but the goat is a male sin offering. Uh, a, a, a sheep sin offering is always female. Even though the Passover lamb is male. So there was an argument by our Jewish brothers. How can Yeshua be a sin offering because the sheep is female? It's because it's not the sheep, my friend. It's a goat. It's Yom Kippur's offering that through the menorah pattern is linked to Passover and unleavened bread. Through the menorah pattern. So the work that is done on the cross linking to Passover, sacrifice of the lamb, is automatically linked to the two goats where the one is the scapegoat taking the sin away of the world and the other one is taking sin upon himself so those two components of the lamb of god is the passage of a lamb taking away the sin of the world and being the sin offering is the passage of a lamb and the two goats all connected into one and that's what john the baptist revealed to us knowing the festivals so searching, certainly searching the goat is certainly searching the Messiah who is my salvation in a time of trouble. That is what they were searching. And this goat is a sin offering that's the male goat of Yom Kippur. And that's what the Rosh Darash is. So the whole of Leviticus and actually the whole of the Torah, Leviticus is the middle book and everything in Leviticus points to this sin offering who is the messiah and the whole torah points to the same thing which is the sin offering which is the work of the messiah so all of scripture links to that and not only that it's in the center of the torah or the heart of the father and john three sixteen says a love man uh, uh, for god to love the world that he gave his only begotten son or goat for sin offering can, you can also use those, that wording because that also is in the heart of the Father. So that is linked to Bakar. And in, in Afrikaans you get the word Bakir. <laughs> that means to become born again. And that's where I think that comes from. It has to do with repentance, faith in Messiah, entering the household. Okay, camels. Camels, Gamal, bear a burden to labor. And this is a picture of the spirit of Yahweh giving you strength. Now, previously I uh, talked about the spirit having different attributes. Can you remember them? There were three previous ones, and I did tell you about the Gimel as well. Who can remember? Spirit of truth, which is which one? So we have the truth. The spirit of truth, and that's the letter Hay. Because Hay means light and revelation. It also means truth. The next one is the spirit. That's holy. The Holy Spirit. Holiness is purification by fire, or a consuming fire, which is the attribute of Yahweh, because of His holiness. And the fire is the letter Shin. 
And then we have the other spirit, which is the hand, which is the letter yod, the invisible hand, the helping hand, the hand and strengthened, strengthened that we saw here. And now we have the spirit that strengthens and also carry. And that is the Gimel. So those are the four attributes or roles of Yahweh's Spirit. So it's not only the Holy Spirit. So if people just refer to Yahweh's Spirit as the Holy Spirit, it's only one aspect of it. The Spirit of Truth reveals the Holy Spirit's function is to make you holy. The hand of the Spirit is to help you to sort out your life. And the strength one is to carry you and give you strength in during specifically during the time of trouble. Um, and that's also associated with the ever-flowing stream. All right, so Gamal, um, Achimel is from the word Gamal, that's a, a primary root, that means benefit, um, treat someone well or treat someone ill. So you can treat someone good or bad, to ripen, to wean, a reward, to yield, and to be bountiful. So yielding, as we saw previously, is to do with the letter nun. Yield is bearing fruit. Bountiful is bearing a lot of fruit. Ripen is also linked to fruit. Um, to wean has to do with the fruit of your body as a human. That's a baby. Reward is basically what you get if you work hard and plant it. Now you have your reward through your harvest. And then the one that's uh, interesting is to treat someone well or to treat someone ill. So this word Gamal is first found in Scripture, Genesis 21, verse 8. And that says, um, well the context is where Isaac was weaned, the day Isaac was weaned. I don't know how old he was. But on that day, they held a feast or they had a celebration because of this event. But the same day, Ishmael was cast away or cut off with his mother Hagar. So now we see there's a feast day. The one gets treated well and the other one was treated ill. And then there's a separation happening. What does that sound like? It sounds like the Day of Judgment to me. Because the Day of Judgment will be on a feast day. There will be celebration for the ones who are accepted. They are the ones who we yield a bountiful number of fruit. And in the opposite, I can say those who do not bear fruit will be separated and cut off with their mother. And who is their mother? In Revelation is revealed as Babylon. She's the mother of harlots. So, and it happens during a feast, and the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Yom Kippur are the two feasts that are associated with the time of trouble, which is the tribulation or the judgment of the judge, which is Yeshua. So the day of the Lord that you read in the Old Testament is actually the day of Yeshua, because he is the one who is the judge, not the father. And he is the one who will come and judge the nations. And to him is given the authority to judge. So we only think he's the good guy. The father is the angry one. He want to kill, kill you because you're doing something wrong. He's going to judge you. But it's actually Yeshua who's the judge. And he's the savior as well. And he's the king who will rule. So all of those attributes are equated to or linked to Yeshua. Okay, so I've got a little picture here. That just picture that. So I've got Sarah on the one side, which is a bond woman which is Shibcha, that's the word for bond woman. And Hagar is a bond servant called Amma. So there's two words associated to the two women. And they both appear to be bond women, but the one is a slave woman, and the other one is a bond woman. Now, bond woman is similar to a bond servant. This bond servant is where your ear is nailed to the house of your master. Yet again, the symbol of the house, that's where you will enter into and live with your master, and you are now adopted into that household. So that's the bond woman. She is adopted. She's being treated well because she is a bond woman, and she 
has an offspring, Isaac, that means laughter and joy. So there's rejoicing and it's the feast. And he is weaned that day, so that means he's growing up into maturity. So her offspring is now coming to maturity and growing up. And they hold a feast. And then there's a separation taking place on the opposite side. The other woman is the counterfeit bride, which is Babylon, or the religious system that infiltrated a lot of religions, or that creates religion. Um, and she has an offspring called Ishmael. That means um, Elohim hears. He's listening, but this time he's not listening at the laugh. He's listening at the cries of the unjust crying because they are cast out or cut off because they do not bear fruit. They are fruitless and linked to the word gen, grace. You need the fruitful component to access the chet, which is this. It's a prerequisite for this. All right, so that is the picture of the word. Where did I get that again? Just want to quickly jump back to connect it, otherwise I'm. So that was where we found the word Gamal, first in scripture in Genesis 12:16, where Sarah was taken by Pharaoh, and Abraham received all those gifts. That's associated with this. So those are the benefits we also have. And this is the end result or the goal that we are going to achieve if we partake in the processes that um, has to do with repentance. The continual flowing stream, certainly searching or continuous searching that I can bear fruit and be fruitful and have offspring of my own. So the next one is the menorah pattern of uh, Gimel, which is Gimel Mem Lamet. So Mem is the most important. Mem is in the middle. Gimel is on the right, and Gimel is in the spiritual, and that has to do with the carrying and the strength that is supporting this function. Lamet on the left-hand side has to do with the shepherd's staff, following the shepherd. It's also to do with learning. So the most important thing is the word. Now this is now in the context of the gimel that gives strength and the continual flowing water. So the strength part is coming from the right side, which is the gimel that means camel that carries you through the wilderness or a troubled time. The mem is the continual flowing stream, and the learning is what you do in the physical. And the learning goes hand in hand with following the shepherd, who is Yeshua, our teacher. And that's why the word is the most important part. That's why you can't separate the word from the spirit. Because the spirit is depicted by a gimel. And the core of that word gimel is also the mem, which is the word or the stream. And also the, the, the agent that cleanses or the medium that cleanses us. So, I heard something the other day when I was listening to a Christian radio. This guy said that the Spirit of God is not given to reach out towards the sinners. It's there to sanctify those who are already in, in a household. The Spirit is given for sanctification of the saints, not to get the uh, sinners in. Pentecost was associated with people believing, so they accepted the Messiah, and then the outpouring of the Spirit came as a result of that. Uh, if people just receive the Spirit without the knowledge of the Gospel and what's happening, it will just be like a nice manifestation or whatever they, they can call it. The Spirit can only follow truth, and the truth that was preached was the gospel message of who is the Messiah and what he came to do, and repentance. And those who believe, they receive the outpouring of the Spirit, which was the next step, which is sanctification. I'm not saying that the Spirit doesn't work within people, but it, work, it works from the outside in. But once you receive the Spirit inside of you, it's for sanctification.
that's the main function as we saw here all right so let's move on we're going to look at the transition when we started with aleph bet gimel last time we looked at aleph bet which made the word av or father which is the first and second word now we're going to look at the second and the third word which is bet gimel which makes the word bug or bag <laughs> what does bag mean <laughs> let's see Um, bug or bag means spoil, booty, or a reward. So the picture we see is we had the Aleph. In Bereshit, it was a hidden Aleph, but in this case, it's actually a, a solid Aleph, which is depicting Yahweh. Then it is the house of the Father. And if you connect those two, you get the word Father. And proceeding from this house came a camel, or the gimel, going into the wilderness to fulfill a certain function. What does that camel has to do? What is the function of the camel? It is to bring a spoil back, or a booty back, or a reward back into the house. If I can describe it in the sense of catching fish, it's the net that's being cast out. The function of the net is to bring the spoil or the booty in. So the function of the camel being sent out into the wilderness is to bring people back with him. So that's also the symbol of the camels that was given, or the camels that was uh, watered at the, f at, the, at the well where Isaac's wife was chosen. That's connected to a camel. And she was the chosen one because she was prepared to water the camels. Now the camel is the means of carrying someone into the house. And that's why it's associated with carrying a yoke, bearing a burden, being an effort. It takes an effort to work with people, to talk to people, to try and break through to them. Don't you understand the work of the Messiah or this or that or the other? And you can go on in circles and people will argue about it. It's a hard process to get those people to get on the camel, and walk into the house. They want to kick and scream and want to take something along or want to hold on to something um, that's still fixed in this world and they can't really move on. So the function of the camel is the function of the net and that is to bring people in. And that's the function of Yahweh's spirit as well. Because he goes out and following the message, he will work within the people, strengthen them, give them that continual stream which is the core function of the word, learning, giving them strength, and then they will follow him back into the house. So that is what the second and the third letter teach us. Now the word back, bark, let's rather say bark, is found in first found in Ezekiel twenty five seven, where Yahweh stretched out his hand against Ammon. Um why did he do it? I didn't have a day. But anyway, he stretched out his hand against Ammon. Ammon is made up of partially of the word Am, that means people or nations. So this is a picture of Yahweh stretching out his hand towards the nations or the people to bring them in. And that's also the calling of the people that's associated with the function of the camel bringing them in. The matria of Gimel Mem Lamet is 73, Lamet is 30, Mem is 40, three, uh, Gimel is 3, and this is in the dictionary. It's not in the Zohar, it comes from Hebrew. Just want to reiterate that. One of the words that add up to 73 that's linked to this, that's very profound which is not sorcery or witchcraft, is the word Bea, Bet, Ayan, Aleph, that means to ask, to seek, to make petition, or to pray. Now we get the concept of praying in the spirit, and that suddenly li uh, lights up. Oh, there's something in the New Testament that's linked to the spirit, that is linked to prayer, that is linked to a gimel, that is linked to the spirit that gives me strength, that's associated with his word as well. 
So how am I strengthened if I read Jude 120? What does it say? I'm strengthened if I pray in the Spirit. Yeah. And what does it say here? The gimel is a symbol of strength and it's linked to pray. So if I pray in the Spirit, I'm strengthened. Perfectly harmonizing with the New Testament, found in the Old Testament, and in Kabbalistic uh, numerology. No, not really, I'm joking. Um, just confirming the New Testament over and over and over again that the Hebrew harmonizes with what Yeshua said, with what Paul said, with what all the other people said, and we see it in a beautiful picture linking all those things. Now this word, Be'a, is amazing. It's found five times in the book of Daniel. And each one of them is linked to another idea of what prayer is all about. So this whole thing is about prayer. This gematria linked to Gimel telling us what kind of prayers are there or what are they there for. The first one is in Daniel 2 verse 13 where there was a decree that went out to slay the wise men, which is Daniel and his friends. Um, uh, oh, sorry, to slot, which is uh, oh, to sort them, to seek them, bear, so that they can be slain. Now, this is a, a, a prayer to pray against the enemy who wants to destroy the truth, which is the wisdom, and want to destroy the people of Yahweh carrying the truth, and that is better known as spiritual warfare. So that's that kind of prayer. That we see here. The next one is found in Daniel 2 verse 16. Daniel desired, which is Be'ah, from the king, time to give interpretation of the wisdom of the dream. And this is, if you pray in the spirit, what do you do? You pray for interpretation of the things that you don't understand. And that's exactly what this means. It's to get the wisdom or interpretation of that kind of prayer. And that's also found in the New Testament. Daniel 2.18. They desire, they are, mercies from Elohim of Shamahim, or, or the Elohim of heaven, um, concerning this secret, which is the word in the wisdom, revelation, interpretation. So you ask Yahweh to have mercy upon us, and his protection to be able to speak these words. So this is the prayer of protection or the prayer of covering. And it's also to do with, um, yeah, no, it's, it's asking for mercy. So it's asking for, for protection and petitioning your case before him. So it's also linked to intercession. Intercession and protection. All right, the next one is Daniel 2.23, where it says, um, Praising Yahweh for his wisdom, given from the Elohim of Shamim, or the Elohim of heaven, who made known what was desired, which is Be'ah. So now we see the prayer of praise, praising Yahweh. Now I've done a little menorah pattern of the word Be'ah, bet ayin. Aleph. Now, Aleph is strength or ox. And it's also a symbol of revealing the Aleph in the physical or revealing the character of the Father in the physical. The middle branch is the iron, that means eye or to see. That's where the interpretation or the knowledge of the wisdom comes from. It's spiritual sight. And the bet is what comes from the house. So that's the source of where. The information about the Father comes from, and the information about the revelation of that wisdom comes from. The source is the house. So that's the word um, pa'a, that means to pray. So when you pray, one thing you will get is strength. Another thing that you will get is insight, spiritual insight. And then you will enter into the presence, which is the house. So those are also the three things that you will get. If you pray. And the fifth one.
is Daniel 2.49. Daniel requested Be'ah of the king that he and his friends to be set up as leaders. So that is praying for spiritual guidance, spiritual leadership. So that these people will not perish. So that they will be um, led within that household. So let's quickly recap. So we've got leadership. We've got praise. We've got protection and intercession. Um, we've got interpretation. And we've got praying for strength. Or be strengthened praying in the spirit. And those are the five kinds of prayer revealed by the gematria of the word Gimel that's associated with the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Yahweh that gives strength that carries you and that open up that continual flow of that stream that nourishes you as you travel through the wilderness and that is all folks <laughs> there's still um, a few things that I didn't do but I'll do a little video maybe tomorrow or throughout the weekend of the names of Daniel, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they are also associated with prayer. I'll give a bit more insight on that, but I ran out of time, uh, not to uh, able to prepare. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Yeah, I'll email. I will email all of this. I've already screenshot it. So I'll email it, um, and this video will be available on YouTube as well. I'm trying to write a bit neater. Yeah. Maybe on a book without lines might also help. No, there's... Um, <laughs> now, what I do, I, 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 I sit on the bus with my phone and, and a book, and then I make my notes. And then I write them over in my larger book that I take pictures of, that you saw here, so... Yeah. Yeah, the spirit cannot be separated from the word and the word will not have its depth and its essence without the interpretation of his spirit. His spirit gives life. It's that water that cleanses and nourishes. It's that aspect of his spirit that's in conjunction with his word that just brings it all to life. Rhema, yeah. Yeah, logos is the written word, Rhema is the revealed word. But it's both the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the one is enlightened. And also personified. So if you read something that means something to you, it's the spirit that quickens it or reveals it to you personally. Or it can be something that is on a deeper level of revelation, which might be pertaining to end times or his character or whatever. So there's different levels of, of Rhema. Yeah. And just a quick thing on the on the word, the word or words is one of the mediums that Yahweh chose to recreate and to create with. So he spoke everything into existence, and he's still speaking things into recreation or into restoration. So if we refuse any of the words that's been written, that's now been spoken, we will not be recreated. That's why it's very dangerous, and there's two passages that warns us against taking away from Scripture, adding to Scripture. If you take away from Scripture, your name will be taken out of the book of life. If you add to the Scripture, there will be plagues added to you in the time of judgment. So please don't touch his word, taking out pages, metaphorically, saying, Ah, oh, this is rubbish, it's old, I don't want this. Don't like, oh, I like this one. It's got a lot of blessings in there. I want that. There's money in there. I want this one. Uh, health. I want this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so 
treat the words of Yahweh with respect. Do not take away, do not add. By adding to the word is people's own little interpretation, doctrine thingy that's hanging there on one leg on the side. It's not really confirmed scripture. It's an idea that's loosely linked to a passage somewhere. Um, or it's just truth that stands on one leg. You know, it's very hard to emphasize. This is it. Nothing else. Um, that's not balanced truth and you will fall over. So be careful on how you treat the word because it's all about your restoration and you will limit the work that he wants to do in you if you limit the amount of words that you are receiving from him. But I want to absorb everything from Genesis to the last sentence of Revelation. Everything I just want to absorb because that will be my total restoration. And that will elevate me like that last prayer to be a leader one day during a thousand years so that I can rule over nations with him. I'm not the one that's going to be the least who spoke against the commandments. I'm going to be greatest because I'm going to teach his commandments. I'm not going to be there sweeping, washing toilets in the New Jerusalem. I'm going to rule over nations in the New Jerusalem. So that's the reward I want. That's my aspirational target. Not there yet. I'm aiming for the top. I might end up in the middle, middle ground there. We, we're not all perfect, especially me. Yeah. All right. So, say again. Yep. Yeah, so it's a flow. Now we approach Yahweh from left to right, and whatever comes from him flows from the right to the left. So this is a two-way relationship. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'll just pray, and then we can. Uh, no, we just want to close off, and then we can have prayer requests. Thank you, Father, for your word and your truth. Thank you for just getting so much from one letter. Just getting so much from a number getting so much from a few passages linked together, giving us a beautiful picture. Thank you, Father, we can join those things together and just see the, the work and the purpose, the processes and the things that's important to you, to put together the puzzle pieces on the intent of your scripture, harmonizing with the rest of scripture, not cancelling out, not uh, giving a new idea, but just supporting what's already there. Father, I just want to speak life over people who have been speaking death, specifically over your word and over what I'm trying to, to achieve. Father, I just ask that you bless them. I just ask that you give them a, a revelation so that they can have insights that not even I understand, that you will bless them so much with insight so they can know you better. And I ask, Father, that you be with us all. Whenever we go through a time of trouble, a time of tribulation, a time of persecution, that we will have strength because we've got this continual stream just flowing from you, from your word and your spirit that gives us strength, continually strength, strengthening us and carrying us through these hard times. Father, you know, everybody that sits here has got something that they go through, some difficult time that they go through, some challenge that they face. Not, each, uh, not, not uh, any one of us are... Uh, uh, free from any of that Father I just ask your strength of your spirit I just speak life over those situations and I just ask that you reveal yourself to us within each of those situations in a powerful way because you are inside of that you're behind those things and you will reveal yourself to us if we look for you in the midst of these troubled times and Father I thank you for allowing us to have that understanding we thank you that we can uh, discuss your word and that you allow us to apply that those words to our lives so we can be restored into your image and eventually back into your kingdom, into your household. I just give you praises and I give you glory in the mighty name of Yeshua Masiach. Amen. So many blessings.
to his mighty name. Amen.